Okay, right, so we talked last time about pricing power. We introduced the model of monopoly. Uh, so notes about that, pricing power can come about whenever competition is limited in some way. Uh, in order for there to be pricing power, there needs to be a lack of competition. In order for that pricing power to stick around, there needs to be a barrier to entry that keeps people from coming to compete against you, even though you're making a profit, right? Some sort of wall between Tacoma and Seattle that keeps the Tacoma snow shovel producers from coming in when we have a snowstorm, right? That would allow the, Tacoma, the uh, Seattle snow shovel producers to keep them across. In that regard. Um, first, the price of our see downward sloping demand curves. When we drew the individual firm's curves for a competitive market, the demand curve for an individual firm was completely flat, right? Because they have no control over the price. They can produce this much and get this price. They can produce this much and get this price. No difference. They have no effect because they're too small relative to the market. But the firm with pricing power has a downward sloping demand curve, which means that they can choose. Do I want to sell a high price, low quantity, or a low uh, price, high quantity? Um, it just means that they, they have the ability to generate profit, which doesn't go away in the long run, as opposed to a competitive market where we'd expect profits to go to zero. Um, but we also only really talked about monopoly, right, where there's really only one firm in the market. Uh, this is clearly not the only way in which price and power can come up. So we're going to talk about two other market structures, other kinds of ways in which you could see some pricing power, even when it's not a monopoly or even close to a monopoly, right? Uh, one of those is called oligopoly, where you have a few firms, a few big firms on relatively even footing, but not, so more than one, but less than a lot, which you need for competition. We're also going to talk about monopolistic competition, uh, which is where you do have a lot of firms, right? You have a lot of firms just like you would in a competitive market, but they're not really perfectly competing with each other because they're they're all distinguishable in some way. They each have their own sort of like tiny little monopoly, even though they're really part of a bigger market. So remember last time I talked about how the cafe downstairs is technically a monopolist because they're the only cafe in this building. That's sort of the world we're going to be talking about the monopolist competition, right? They do have a little bit of pricing power in this building. I'd pay more for a coffee that's right downstairs than having to walk across the street to get it, right? I'd be willing to pay a little more. So they're not perfectly competitive with each other but they're also basically in competition with each other, right? So it's not really monopoly. It's not really competition. It's monopolistic competition, right? Uh, lastly, this is not a uh, market structure, but we're also gonna talk about price discrimination. Uh, it's something that comes up a lot. Uh, you see it everywhere uh, and it happens all the time. And it is something that you can do with price pricing power um, that uh, does a couple of interesting things. We'll talk about it when we get there. All right, so, uh, our basic idea here, if we have lots of firms and they're all selling the same thing, we have a competitive market, right? You're talking about everyone, all, a bunch of different farmers selling grain, that's a competitive market. You're talking about a bunch of different stockbrokers all selling the same stock, competitive market. You have a lot of firms, but their products are what are called differentiated, which means that a consumer would not consider them to be identical and interchangeable. That's when you have monopolistic competition. So I don't consider the cab, the coffee downstairs to be the same as the, star, uh, the coffee from the Starbucks across the street because this one is closer to me. Or I don't consider a shirt uh, from a favorite brand to be the same as a shirt from a different brand because I prefer one brand over the other, right? So I differentiate between those two products, which gives those products a bit of pricing power. That's monopolistic competition. We can be in a situation where we have one firm, that's monopoly, that's what we really talked about last time, or we could be in a situation where we have a few firms, oligopoly, so more than one, but less than a lot, whatever a lot is. So we're gonna talk about oligopoly first. So uh, an oligopoly is a market controlled by a small number of large firms. So we have more than one, it's not a monopoly. Um, we have less than whatever you would need to make it competitive. Some nebulous number, that's not a real specific number. Um, they sell similar or identical products, uh, and there are a lot of them. A lot of national level markets are oligopolies, um, especially if you're a little bit uh, lenient about what, how you define similar identical product. Obviously, different big firms have differences in their products, but if they're similar enough, we would still call it an oligopoly. A great example is airlines. Airlines are an example of an oligopoly. The airline industry is fairly concentrated. There are four major airlines. Now there are lots of small competitors as well, but uh, these four each hold about 20% of the market. And then all the other airlines are about 20% in aggregate. So first of all, uh, 
we have pricing power. I'm going to say tell you that there's some pricing power here, even though there is competition between these firms. We, they are still going to hold some pricing power. Where's that pricing power come from? Well, there must be a barrier to entry somewhere. The barrier to entry here is that it's super, super expensive to start an airline. You want to start an airline, you have to buy a lot of planes. And here's the kicker, you need to get gate space at airports. You can't just do that. You can't just walk up and say, I will pay you this much for a new gate space at the airport. They're all taken, right? So you can't just get into an airport with your new airline. Uh, you have to find some way to free up some gate space for yourself. So there's both high startup costs, which makes it hard to compete. And then also uh, the existing airlines have control over an important input, which is gate space at the airport. Um, this can be something that can keep regional airlines from going national, right? It's just really expensive to, even if you already have a small airline, so you've gotten rid of some of those startup costs, you have the planes, it's really expensive to expand to another airport, right? I like to fly Alaska. Uh, it's hard to find an Alaska flight between two, two different airports on the East Coast, right? You can't fly really from like New York to Boston. Maybe you can't that one specifically, but like in general, you can't do that. Uh, why? Because it'd be really, really expensive for them to expand their purview that they already have to cover those two new areas, right? Just high, high startup costs. So, we have some pricing power, so I can tell you that a lot of the same things are going to happen with oligopoly that are going to happen with monopoly. We're going to have prices that are too high, inefficiently high, and we're going to have quantities that are a little bit too low, inefficiently low. So we are going to have that same sort of deadweight loss. But how do we get there? Right? You have to sort of think about this because there is competition in this market. There's competition between the different oligopolies. And if you, you know, if you think back to how why we said that in the competitive market, prices should go down to that equilibrium quantity or that equilibrium price. Well, why, why did we say that, right? Here, what was the story that we told? We said, okay, imagine the price is too high. There's gonna be some consumer out there who says, you know what? I'm not willing to buy an airline ticket at this high price, but if you lower it just a little bit, you could sell to me. Uh, and then all the airlines would say, well, you know, we'd rather keep the price high, but I, I'm gonna just sort of, you know, lower my price just a little bit so I can sell to you, right? I'm gonna expand my customer base. I'm gonna sort of, um, and I'm willing to do that because it's still above my marginal cost. And then suddenly the price goes down. And then that's going to keep happening until we get to that equilibrium price. Now, there's nothing about that story that I just said that has anything to do with how many competitors there are as long as there's one. If there's one person out there who's willing to lower their prices uh, in order to meet the, the, some new customers, we should expect this exact same story to play out and end up at the exact same spot where the equilibrium price is. And yet it doesn't. So in order for an oligopoly to keep their high prices, right? We still have pricing power. We expect prices to be a bit too high. There needs to be something that keeps them from fully competing. So they're going to compete, but they're not going to compete as hard as they could. That's the story that we're telling. 